Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, SIDA seminars. So today I'm very happy to introduce uh, Larry Widrow, who is a professor at Queen's University since 1993 and working on galactic dynamics there. Uh, he got his PG uh, from uh, the University of Chicago on superconducting cosmic string and cosmic magnet field uh, in 1988. Uh, then he moved to Harvard for a postdoc where he suggested that sterile neutrinos could be dark matter. Uh, then he did a, another postdoc here at CEDA and working on large scale structure and uh, Andromeda and doing simulations with uh, John Dubinsky. And then, uh, so that's how he started from uh, particle uh, physics and cosmology to uh, galactic dynamics. And so today's talk is more about uh, galactic snails and galactic dynamics. Thank you, Larry. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for the invitation and for uh, arranging the visit. Uh, it's always good to be back at CETA and see some familiar faces and meet some of the new uh, new postdocs here. Um, this talk is going to uh, draw a connection between an old idea of how spiral structure formed uh, called swing amplification, which dates back to uh, early work by Julian and Tumre, Goldwright, Linden, Linden Bell, and Tremaine in the 60s and 70s, to relate this to a new feature of galactic dynamics, something that was discovered in the second data release of Gaia, by Antoha et al. in, in 2018. Uh, but before we get there, I'll uh, first begin with the review of disequilibrium and galactic disks, an overview. Uh, talk about the Gaia phase spirals or, or the Gaia snail, as it's sometimes called. Uh, I'll describe some work that I've done on Oort's estimate for the local gravitational potential and its connect connection with phase spirals. Um, describe some interesting but unsuccessful attempts to reproduce the phase spirals in Sagittarius and Milky Way simulations. Um, and then finally talk about this new work that I've done on swing amplification uh, and phase spirals in the shearing box approximation. And then if there's time, I know there's some people here interested in Gaussian process regression. Uh, probably won't be time, but uh, it's something that I'm interested in and perhaps after the talk, uh, we could discuss that. So galaxies display uh, uh, quite a wide range of complicated structures. Uh, the most conspicuous examples are our bars, which we see here, a, a strongly barred galaxy um, uh, with, with two-armed spiral structure. But we can also have spiral structure in galaxies that, um, uh, that don't have bars. And then in edge on galaxies, we often find that galaxies are warped. And so we're seeing uh, perturbations and structure out of the plane of the disk. And so one way to, um, uh, to uh, study these phenomena is to try to do a simulation, a cosmological simulation that begins with uh, uh, some uh, cosmological initial conditions. We put in a prescription for gas dynamics and, and star formation. Um, uh, AGN feedback, and then we see if the galaxies that we produce look like the galaxies in our universe. And this is one uh, montage uh, put, uh, put out by the Niehau simulation. And you can see that, that now the simulations are doing a pretty good job of matching uh, the galaxies that we see in our universe. But if we're interested in galactic dynamics, then there's much to be learned by thinking about how galaxies, how it a, a system of, uh, of stars and, and dark matter uh, would evolve from some pristine uh, initial condition, say axisymmetric, symmetric about the midplane of the galaxy. We can build such an equilibrium model um, using something like Jeans theorem, and then use n-body simulations to follow the onset of instabilities or the response to external perturbations. And so this is a, a, a nice animation that uh, John Dubinsky made um, using an IC code that we developed, uh, which shows the um, uh, development of spiral structure and a bar, uh, and as well, uh, here we go. Um, we can explore what happens when we embed a disk in a, in a dark matter halo that has uh, substructure in it and, and see what effect the substructure has 
on um, on uh, bar formation and, and, and development of spiral structure. So there are many open questions that one can, uh, can look at. Um, all of these phenomena, I think, have some, uh, th there's some theoretical understanding, but there are still open theoretical questions. Uh, for example, we see bars in about two thirds of all this galaxies, uh, but there's a puzzle as to why some galaxies form bars and others don't. Uh, there's a nice paper by Selwood and Shen on M33, which doesn't have a bar, and they struggle in a series of simulations uh, to produce a model that has the right spiral structure but no bar. And so you can you can play with the mass of the disk and and produce something that doesn't have a bar, but then it doesn't have the right spiral structure. So there are still these puzzles that we have regarding these large scale structures. Yeah. Bar is more common. I don't know. Uh, at at low redshift, so so generally the the bar fraction tends to rise with time, um, and that's a that depends on the mass of the galaxies and and so on so on so yeah. So other questions we might ask: uh, are, are spiral arms transient features of a disk, or are they continuously regenerated? This goes back to this early work by Tumray and others on swing amplification, where we believe that. Uh, the process of swinging a leading perturbation into a trailing perturbation um, uh, amplified along the way is, is responsible for spiral structure. Uh, but there's been more recent work by Selwood and Carlberg uh, that tries to um, get to the question of what, what perturbations uh, uh, start off the swing amplification process. And then once the spiral, the, those spirals fade away, uh, is there a process by which they can be regenerated? Further questions, what role does the structure of dark halos play in, uh, in the evolution of galactic disks? This goes back to this classic paper by Ostreicher and Peebles, who showed that if you took an isolated disk uh, and let it evolve, then it generally formed these bar-like structures. Um, and here, uh, finally, one way uh, to stabilize a disk is to add a hot component. So this is one of the first uh, examples in the literature of discussing the connection between uh, dark matter halos and uh, galactic dynamics. Um, but this is uh, the, the connection between halos and disks is, is much more complicated than that. Um, halos also provide a place for the inner disk to dump its angular momentum. Um, and so the bars that you get if you just embed a disk in a static halo uh, are weaker and form more slowly than the ones if you um, embed the disk in a live dark matter halo where the inner disk can dump its angular momentum uh, outward. And there's, there's a lot of interesting questions that one can address, uh, as I've done with a graduate student, um, on what happens when you embed the disk in a prograde or retrograde uh, dark halo. So not the topic of this uh, seminar, but something that I'm I'm quite interested in. So now we turn to the vertical structure of disks, and this is more in, in uh, uh, keeping with the topic of this seminar. Um, so in edge on galaxies, we often find that they uh, they display these strong warps. In the Milky Way, we can map out the, the warp more carefully. And so we see that the the disk of the Milky Way is warped up on one side and down on the other at about the one or two kiloparsec level. Uh, but there's a lot of substructure in the warp of the disk. And as well, this warp is extending in toward the center of the galaxy. And so now in the age of Gaia and some of the pre-Gaia surveys, we've found more examples of interesting structure in the, in the, vertical, the vertical structure of the disk of the galaxy. Uh, it was a, a nice work by Shu and, and Heidi Newberg and company um, using Sloan data in which they found evidence that the disk of the Milky Way is corrugated. And so the, the observations that they're doing here, they're looking um, out from the sun toward the uh, outer parts of the disk. Uh, they're looking above and below the midplane of the disk and finding um, alternating uh, enhancements in the number density, either above or below the galactic midplane. And they interpret that as a warp, uh, as a corrugation of the disk um, at a 
fairly small level, but still something that they uh, that they can model uh, about 100 parsecs. The Milky Way disk is going up and down at about 100 parsec level with a wavelength on the order of a few kiloparsecs or so. I think that this is probably related to um, uh, work by Schoenrich and Denon on the extension of the warp into the solar neighborhood. Um, and so here, rather than looking at number counts, they're looking at vertical velocity. Uh, and rather than mapping vertical velocity as a function of galactocentric radius, they're doing it as a function of guiding radius or angular momentum about the spin axis of the disk. And here they find in this mean vertical velocity a linear trend, which they interpret as the extension of the warp toward the solar neighborhood, and superimposed on that this wave-like uh, feature. And so some ripple in vertical velocity superimposed on the warp coming into the solar neighborhood. So this actually all takes us back to uh, really the beginning of the study of galactic dynamics, um, and in particular, the vertical structure of the disk uh, this seminal work by Ort in 1932, in which he's attempting to determine the force, uh, the vertical force in the solar neighborhood. Um, and I like this quote here, a third purpose was the derivation of an accurate value of total amount of mass, including dark matter. Um, so here he is uh, four or five years before Zwicky talking about uh, measuring the amount of mass um, uh, in the solar neighborhood using this very local determination. So the idea in, in or its work is to um, uh, begins with, with the assumption that one can decouple the vertical motions in the solar neighborhood with the in-plane motions. Um, and then if, if we uh, assume that the stars locally are in vertical equilibrium, then we can write down an equation uh, that looks like an equation of hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, use this to determine this uh, vertical potential, which then feeds into Poisson's equation, which includes a part for the uh, contribution from the forces in the plane of the disk, um, and get an estimate for the total dark matter, uh, total density of all matter in the solar neighborhood. And so this has now become known as Oort, the Oort program, measure the density and dispersion of tracers as a function of Z, um, infer the vertical potential, compute the total density via Poisson's equation, um, and then subtract the density of known objects to get, infer the local dark matter density. And so this was something that uh, my collaborators, uh, Susan Gardner, Brian Yanni, Scott Dodelson, um, and I were attempting to do with Segway data. Uh, the idea was that Segway had measurements of number densities and velocities above and below the midplane of the galaxy. Uh, and so we could map out the number density plot, uh, which we've done here, which is nicely fit by a thin disk and th thick disk components. Um, but when we fit this to simple models, we found these sort of initially annoying residuals at about the 10% level. So subtract off uh, a smooth model from the local dark matter density, um, and, and we find these residuals, which are not symmetric about the midplane of the, of the galaxy. And so that was a puzzle. Um, in addition, when we looked at velocities, we found what seemed to be evidence for motions, uh, vertical motions that varied with uh, position relative to the midplane of the disk. And so here it seemed like the, the locally the disk was uh, moving away from the midplane, or there were streaming motions away from the midplane of the disk, so like a breathing type motion. Um, and as well, the velocity dispersion was, was asymmetric about the galactic midplane. And so these number counts and velocity profiles suggest that the disk in the solar neighborhood um, is bending and breathing in the direction normal to the galaxy, that, that there's something, uh, some disequilibrium motions uh, that are affecting uh, both number counts and, and velocities. So this takes us to 2018 and Gaia uh, data release two and the discovery by Antoha and collaborators of this uh, curious uh, phase spiral or snail. And I don't know how well that's um, showing up in number counts, uh, there we go, but you should be able to see a spiral-like pattern in the number counts 
um, that they're measuring in the solar neighborhood. And so in equilibrium, you would expect a, a Maxwellian type distribution, but there's clearly some feature here um, in, the, in the local number counts. So the interpretation of this um, is straightforward enough. If the stars in the midplane of the galaxy were in a harmonic potential, and you displaced uh, our Maxwellian distribution from the midplane, then they would just, all the stars would just orbit around uh, the, the midplane of the galaxy um, at the same angular frequency. Uh, but if the potential is anharmonic, which of course it must be since the density isn't constant, um, uh, then any displacement or perturbation uh, that you impose on this distribution is going to wind up into a, a phase spiral. And I highly recommend this paper by Scott um, on the geometry of phase mixing. So we should keep in mind that what we're doing here is taking slices and projections of the fundamental object, which is the six dimensional phase space distribution function. And so one begins with this object, which describes positions and velocities of all the stars uh, in the solar neighborhood. Uh, in the Antoja work, we, one takes an arc in galacto, galactocentric radius R, integrates over phi, maybe about 10 degrees or so in galactic uh, azimuth, uh, VR and V phi to get this ZVZ plot. And then if you integrate further, you might imagine getting these number count asymmetries or uh, velocity profiles as well. And so we're, we're starting with this fundamental object and sort of working our way down to different projections. Yeah. Why would you um, fix the light? Right, so that's a good question. So this was what was done initially, but people have, um, have, have, uh, become more sophisticated in in uh, studying the spirals and uh, actually fixing an, an RG in the guiding radius is a much better choice. Um, and trying to map things out in, in these other phase phase dimensions is, is definitely the right way to go. But uh, it does, and the spirals tend to pop out more if you start slicing things in, in LZ. Yeah. Um, and as well, um, and I think this was, you know, definitely one of the things that, that really surprised people at first is that um, if you, instead of plotting number counts, which is difficult to do, and you have the Gaia selection function, uh, which wasn't even known at this time, so this isn't even a true number count plot, um, but instead plot mean V phi or mean V r, then the spirals really pop out. And so that's, I, I you know, the thing to appreciate here is that the stars along the ridge are orbiting around the center of the galaxy at a faster speed than the stars between the ridges of the spiral. Okay, and it pops out more, I think, just because you're doing an average here rather than try to count stars against a, a, a background that's changing uh, in the ZVZ plane. Well, there are other ways to, uh, to look at the data. Uh, some recent work that Axel Widmark and Nayesh, uh, Anish Nayek and I uh, have done with Gaia DR3 and the Starhorse catalog is to look at number count, uh, departures in number counts from some smooth symmetric model uh, at different slices above and below the galactic midplane. And so this is now plotting uh, these departures from a smooth model in the XY plane. So this is the plane of the galaxy. Uh, galactic center is down, galactic rotation is to the right. And so here you would see some enhancement of stars at these uh, near the galactic midplane um, relative to some smooth model for the number counts. And you can also do this in vertical motion as well. And our goal in this exercise was to see if we could identify structures that appear in both number counts and velocity, because if you find structures in number counts and velocity, then you can begin to do dynamics. You, you start to piece together the different terms, say, of the continuity equation or the genes equation and so forth. Um, and so here we're going from below the galactic midplane. You can see that feature. Uh, popping up here near the galactic plane and then disappearing again. And there are other features as well. 
And so uh, with this feature, we think we found is um, evidence that as one moves across this structure, across the structure, one's going from an underdense region of the galaxy to a region where the uh, motion is toward the galactic plane and then an overdense region of the, of the galaxy. And so it, it looks like a sort of breathing wave that's traveling through um, close to the solar neighborhood. So let me um, mention this work that my graduate student, Haoshuan Li, and I have done in, in a couple of papers recently on the Oort problem revisited. And our aim was to simultaneously infer the gravitational potential and the distribution function. And so many attempts at the Oort problem will do one first, say, find a distribution as a function of energy, um, and then use uh, same data set or different data set um, to get the gravitational potential. Um, other approaches use the genes uh, equations, moments of the distribution function. And our goal was to uh, model both the potential and the DF uh, simultaneously. As you'll see, one feature of the method is that we were able, uh, we, we actually found the phase spirals as residuals of the model. Uh, so just a, a few details, maybe the details aren't so important, um, but in this model, we choose a simple parametric form for the local vertical potential. Uh, we uh, devised um, a model for the distribution function, and this is just the distribution function in the vertical phase space components. Uh, that's a little different than ones that are usually used. Um, typically, one uses an isothermal distribution function or a combination uh, to model the thin and thick disk components. Um, we found that we were able to get a better fit if we use this uh, rational linear distribution function, which is inspired by Bernoulli's formula for the exponential function. Um, the nice thing here is that it actually can be thought of as a superposition of isothermal components. And that was inspired by work that Bovey and Ricks and others have done um, showing that a, a, perhaps rather than a thin and thick disk components in the solar neighborhood, um, it's perhaps better to think of a sequence, uh, almost a continuous sequence of subcomponents or subpopulations of the disk, each of which is isothermal at a different vertical velocity dispersion. And so our rational linear distribution function uh, allows us to incorporate some superposition of these subpopulations into a single uh, analytic function. So we were able to infer the vertical potential and force uh, consistent with previous estimates. I don't think our actual determination of the vertical force and potential, um, uh, well, consistent with what people found, Erebar's also comparable to what other people have found for the vertical potential and dark matter density. Um, but I think the more interesting part of this exercise was that uh, we were able, since we modeled the distribution function directly, we could subtract the model from the data and out pop the Gaia snail or Gaia uh, phase spirals uh, directly from the model. And so we're, we're trying to do everything sort of together uh, that is model the, the optimal uh, equilibrium model for the vertical potential and distribution function and then look at the residuals where we then see the, the Gaia phase spiral. Since we have the potential, we can actually map from the ZVZ plane to uh, frequency and angle. So think of angle action variables. Um, and in this case, the phase spirals uh, should, under simplifying assumptions, map onto diagonal bands. And this was something that uh, Nej and, and Scott and Joe uh, have also looked at. So a different way of plotting these phase spirals, if you use omega theta space, then the spirals become diagonal bands. And in the simplifying assumptions, which we'll get to a bit later, uh, the slope of this line just gives you the age of the phase spirals. Um, and it seems like our model, this uh, rational linear distribution function does a pretty good job of matching um, what Bovi et al. found for the subpopulations in the solar neighborhood. 
So we've extended this work to three dimensions and, and there's way more in this plot that, that I can get to in, in this talk, um, but we've modeled the six dimensional phase space distribution function, the three dimensional potential, and then with the full potential and the DF, uh, we can look at the residuals and look at them in these different projections, different, uh, not just vertical uh, frequency, but radial frequency and azimuthal frequency and angles as well. And so you can look for different structures here. Um, you have angle action variables at your disposal. So you can find uh, or uh, find again the moving groups um, that have been seen in the solar neighborhood um, now mapped onto angle action variables given the potential that we self-consistently determine in our model. Well, let's... Uh, Depends on the, you know, you might have a young stellar population, so the recent star formation will be, but presumably salvageable in the overall data, but can you pick out? Yeah, so that, um, it, that's a good question. So, you know, we've, we've treated, well, we've looked at a particular region of the color magnitude diagram, so we're just looking at giants in this particular study. But, but obviously you could try to do this looking at different populations and see what the differences are. And the advantage there is that everyone feels the same potential. Um, and so then you have an extra handle on the distribution functions, right? You, you, you model different distribution functions, but one gravitational potential. And so that, could, that could, should in principle give you a stronger handle on the gravitational potential. So, so let's return to this idea of uh, kinematic understanding of the Gaia phase spirals. Um, and so if we um, begin with the motion that the vertical, uh, the assumption that vertical motion of a star decouples from the in-plane motion. So here's a equilibrium Z V Z distribution function. Stars are moving clockwise uh, around um, the, the mid-plane and W equals zero. Um, so individual stars orbit clockwise. One can calculate the vertical oscillation frequency uh, just by sort of the standard kinematic um, uh, calculations. Um, and then uh, you could ask what happens in this anharmonic potential. And so if you start with a, a, a collection of stars um, uh, distributed along this red line here, go back, here we go. Uh, so if you start with stars distributed just along the red line here, then they will be wound up um, into this spiral pattern and the winding, the pitch angle of the spiral just increases with time, uh, just according to essentially the change in, uh, in this vertical frequency as a, as a function of vertical energy. And so you can do this and that, that gives you a way of dating the spiral um, so here I've taken just a, a potential that's meant to match this famous Besançon model of the galaxy. And at about 900 giga years, you, uh, 900 uh, million years, sorry, <laughs> that would not be right. Um, uh, you end up with a spiral that does a pretty good job of, of matching the, uh, the Gaia snail. Will be mentioned in that uh, nothing, just illustrative purpose. But the idea, I, th I think that, well, the motivation is that if you imagine a kick to the midplane of the galaxy so that all the stars suddenly are moving, say, upward in velocity, then you're going to have a ridge in the distribution function at positive vertical velocity. And that ridge is what gets smeared out into the, um, into the Gaia snail. And so if you you know, here's here's what happens to the red line, but then if you look at the actual Gaia data, of course, the it's 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 not a a sharp blue line. It's it's a smeared out sort of enhancement on top of a smeared background. So yeah, so it's it's a simple thing as you 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 imagine, you know, imagine a um, you know, I don't think that. Uh, yeah, if you imagine, you know, just taking a distribution that's here and giving it a kick in velocity up to this point here, then essentially this enhancement here is what gets sheared into the phase file. Yeah.
So we know I, people have now studied the spirals in, in great detail. This is a, a montage uh, created by uh, Jason Hunt and company with Gaia DR3. Um, and you can, so they're now mapping the Gaia spiral uh, from the inner galaxy to the outer galaxy. And as a function of galactic azimuth, um, uh, and one of the interesting things they find, it's a little difficult to, to tell until you stare at it a, a bit more, is that in the inner part, one has two arm spirals and the outer part, one has one arm spirals. The one arm spirals come from this type of perturbation. The two arm spirals come if you imagine squeezing the distribution function, say in position or velocity, then that's going to wrap up into a two arm spiral. And so one case, it's a sort of breathing perturbation. Uh, you're pushing down toward the midplane and the other, you're bending the disc. And so those are the two basic types of perturbations that one has. And so that's, I don't, no one I think has tried to, mod, well, that gets into the question of whether this kinematic model is even correct. And, and so that's, that's sort of the, um, you're getting to exactly the right question, which is, can we really date the spirals uh, by this kinematic method, or is there something else going on? So some open questions. Is there a common origin um, to the different manifestations of this equilibrium that we've talked about? Uh, are the local phase files transient phenomena or some of some recent event or features of the disk that are continual uh, uh, of a disk that's being continually disturbed? So some of these questions uh, actually parallel our thinking about spiral structure in the galaxy. Um, what's driving the departures from equilibrium? Are they internal instabilities in the galaxy? Uh, there have been suggestions that a buckling bar can generate uh, these space spirals um, or outside agents such as satellite galaxies. And is self-gravity important for the phase spirals or they can, can they be understood from simple kinematic phase mixing? And so an obvious uh, suspect for driving this equilibrium are the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. We now know uh, that there are dozens, or depending on how you count, 100, uh, about 100 uh, satellite galaxies. Um, and certainly the large ones um, uh, are able to do enough damage to the disk um, or cause enough perturbations to the disk that you could imagine them exciting vertical oscillations. And so here's the edge on view of this simulation that uh, Jean-Ray Gauthier and John Dubinsky and I did. Um, and you can see sort of substructure passing through the disk. And sometimes you can catch a little ripple in the vertical structure of the galaxy. So many people in prior to uh, the Gaia phase files were thinking about Sagittarius as um, important in driving the formation of bars and spiral structure in the galaxy. Uh, there was a paper by Purcell in 2011 uh, discussing this possibility. Um, and then by 2013, uh, looking again at these simulations to see if it could produce the number count asymmetries similar to what we saw in the, in the Sloan data. Um, and then more after the phase spirals, uh, if you went back to these simulations and ran new simulations to ask whether a Sagittarius Milky Way encounter could produce the Gaia snail or Gaia phase spiral. And so this is a sequence of face on views from a uh, simulation by Laporte and, and collaborators um, in which Sagittarius makes two passes through the disk of the Milky Way. Um, one here at uh, half a billion years before the last impact, one at the last impact, and then here we are today at, at about 800 million years. And so this idea is that these two impacts um, could have excited enough uh, activity in the vertical structure of the galaxy to generate the phase spirals that we see. And so in fact, they do indeed um, find phase spirals in, uh, in the simulation. So they look at a, a solar neighborhood-like region of their uh, galactic disk and they find phase spirals. So that's a success. Um, but the spirals look nothing like uh, what we see in the data. And so 
um, if you try to, here's the, uh, um, here's the, the Gaia data, and you can sort of count the windings uh, within this region of, of phase space. And I've tried to, um, with Keynote, make this plot here uh, to the same scale. So this one should fit exactly into that one. And the spirals here are not nearly as well-defined and uh, not nearly as tightly wound as the spirals that we see in the real data. And so that seems to be a general feature of the simulations. Yes. Yeah. Simulations converged in the phase coherence and they're uh, converge in the sense that if they use more particles, do they, is this a particle resolution question? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so I think that's a really, that's a really good question is how many particles do you need in a simulation to see this type of substructure in your simulation? I think that's, also, this depends on some fidelity in the, in the long-term phase. Long-term phase. And, and I think we'll get to actually the work of, of uh, Nej and, and, and Scott and so forth the, as, as well, because I think that that actually comes into your question um, as well. So, so I think that the, the simulations are struggling uh, to produce spirals that are as tightly wound or as sharply defined as the ones. And, and you should definitely ask about things like force resolution, mass resolution, Time scale res, you know, are all those things being done properly in these simulations? I'm not going to run correctly, but uh, is that like four in like four or five uh, giga years ago? So why it's only 300 million year past? Uh, the most recent impact um, was. Uh, much more recent than that, yeah. So it's the last, uh, like uh, the the inter impact with the disc. The second, yeah, probably the last two impacts. So maybe it took more than one to excite that, and that also sort of comes into the, the picture. Yeah. Simulations. So what what goes into those sims? What what are they? They're um uh just stars, and so there's no gas dynamics. If that's what and you're is asking. Potential to put in my hand or. Uh, these are so it's live. Uh, no, they're live Sagittarius, live disc, live dark halo simulations. Yeah. And you have to actually up the mass of Sagittarius to, to make things work. So, yeah, so they, so, yeah, so they, these are the heavy end of what Sagittarius is believed to be. Um, and, and there was also a, a, a set of simulations um, done by Morgan Bennett, Joe, uh, and Jason Hunt. Um, as part of Morgan's uh, thesis, um, in which they attempted to reproduce the Gaia phase spirals, and and were generally uh, not successful in doing that, and and sort of the same things. The spirals were never as as sharply defined or as tightly wound as the ones we see. Um, also, they needed an unrealistically large mass. and unrealistically large mass. Yeah. So I I think that you know so the simulations are struggling. Um, uh, there's a recent paper, which uh, perhaps you've already heard about. So a series of papers, but the last one uh, with, with Scott and Nej and, and Joe, um, in which they argue that perhaps what's going on is that the disk is continuously, continually experiencing a sequence of weak perturbations. Uh, they can be large scale perturbations that excite the spirals and then small scale perturbations that lead to phase-based diffusion. And it occurred to me reading the paper that, um, you know, there's also diffusion in your end-body simulations as well. And so when doing the simulations, you should ask that question because you have these super heavy halo particles moving through the disk. And so that's going to cause diffusion. Um, and so now the pitch angle of the spirals comes from the time scale of phase space diffusion rather than a, a singular event. And so it's not that we live in a special time. Everyone sees spirals that look about 500 million years old because that's the time scale of phase space diffusion uh, to wash out any spirals. And so you're, it's so a- depend on so Depends on galactic, right. So, so further tests of this model and, and then you have to think about what is actually causing the diffusion um, is going is will certainly depend on on radius and, and that's something yeah that's something the author certainly uh, so you addressed. Do a full up diffusion in angle. Um, so yeah, so I uh, so you can ask Nesh to give a detailed talk on this, but but they were doing um, uh, 
basically just giving kicks to test particles in a background potential. Uh, so, so they don't have, they don't have, so, so yeah, that's right, that's right. So, so now the question, and, and this will be the question for the last part of the talk, is what role does self-gravity play in the origin and evolution of the phase spirals? And this was something that I became interested in um, uh, with work with my student, Keir Darling, uh, right when the first papers on the spiral came out. Um, if you imagine a perfect, a, a one-dimensional system in which you, uh, it, that's totally self-gravitating and you displace it from its equilibrium, then nothing happens because it's self-gravitating. There are no other potentials around and it defines where equilibrium is. And so that's essentially a zero energy perturbation. If you add a little bit of external force, then you displace the system and it's mostly just gonna orbit around in this external potential, unless the potential external potential is strongly enharmonic. As you increase that external potential, um, the phase wrapping becomes stronger and stronger. And so you can think of a continuum of models in which you're tuning the amount of self-gravity relative to the amount of external potential. And the, and the more external potential you see, the, the sharper the phase spirals and the more uh, spirally things become. And if you think of a local perturbation to the disk, then the external potential can come from the unperturbed distant parts of the disk as well as the dark halo. So it, in some sense, it tells you, it's maybe telling us something about how large a perturbation on the disk uh, uh, has occurred. Okay, so now to the this final section of the talk, which is um, how does swing amplification, or what, what might the connection be with swing amplification um, and the Gaia phase spirals? And I couldn't help going back to this uh, beautiful quote by Tumre, uh, as a matter of law in certain jurisdictions, the charge of conspiracy requires at least three parties. Uh, you can ponder that given the events earlier this week. <laughs> I, I was counting five, but, uh, um, uh, but so it is here. Swing application results from a threefold conspiracy between shear, shaking, and self-gravity. And so to study this question of uh, the connection here between uh, swing application um, one can appeal to the shearing box approximation. Uh, in the original work by Julian and Tumre, it was a shearing sheet, so there was no vertical uh, dimension to their calculations, but we're going to go from the shearing sheet to the shearing box. The idea of the shearing box calculation is that you take a, a, a wedge of an annulus in a rotating disk, map it onto a Cartesian coordinate system, and go to the rotating frame of a particle on a circular orbit at the center of the wedge. Okay, so a particle at the center of the box co-rotating with the box is just a point at the center. Particles on circular orbits move on uh, horizontal lines across the box, left to right or right to left. Um, and particles on more general orbits follow these, this epicyclic motion, either uh, left to right or right to left. Okay. So we're going to, in this shearing box calculation, uh, study the collisionless Boltzmann equation coupled to gravity uh, through Poisson's equation. We'll make two approximations then. So the shearing box approximation is that the size of the box is small compared to the distance of the center of the box to the uh, center of the galaxy, uh, that velocities are small compared with the circular motion of this particle at the center of the box. Um, and the second approximation is that we'll consider linear perturbations uh, to an equilibrium, uh, an equilibrium system. So we can set up a simple equilibrium system. Uh, the system separates in a way that isn't possible in the full uh, disk calculations, um, and then solve for this density uh, uh, perturbation to the potential and perturbation to the distribution function. So the, the key then, you know, straight out of Binney and Tremaine is to write down the linearized collisionless Boltzmann equation. Um, 
And upon rearranging the terms, realize that one can write an explicit integral solution for the distribution function. And that's the key step in these calculations. Uh, we can calculate uh, F1 uh, as an integral calculation over the unperturbed distribution function and the perturbed potential. When phi one includes self-gravity, then you have to do this uh, in some uh, self-consistent iterative uh, form. It's called a Volterra equation, uh, but the numerical techniques are, are pretty straightforward. We can start by thinking of just a simple um, uh, perturbation defined by wave number KY. And so this perturbation here, it's a leading perturbation. So um, uh, the direction of rotation is right to left. So this is leading perturbation and it gets sheared into a trailing perturbation. So that's the, uh, the shear part of the conspiracy. Um, and just from geometry and solving uh, the Green's function for the perturbed potential, you find that there's an enhancement as one swings from leading to trailing, uh, 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 just from, again, the geometry of this perturbation. Okay. So that's the first part. Um, the integral breaks out into two parts, and the first is the one that was considered in Julian and Tumre, um, and that couples essentially uh, gravitational forces in the plane of the disk coupled with uh, gradients in the unperturbed distribution function relative to the momentum in the plane of the disk. And so that coupling can take um, an initial perturbation, say from some external uh, potential perturbation and turn it into a spiral. The term that wasn't considered there because they were doing a shearing sheet and not a shearing box, um, couples gradients in the vertical force uh, with gradients in the unperturbed potential relative to the vertical velocity or vertical momentum. And so that coupling doesn't change the surface density, doesn't enhance the surface density, does nothing for generating spiral structure, which is why it could be safely ignored by Julian and Tumre and so forth. Uh, but it does lead to these spirals in the vertical uh, phase space distribution function. And so with this calculation, one can turn self-gravity on and off. And if you turn off self-gravity, then you find uh, that the, um, the surface density of this wave as it sweeps from leading to trailing uh, goes through these uh, 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 oscillatory peaks. Um, and essentially, we're seeing uh, the effect of the shear. Um, and also uh, the fact that particles are cycling in and out of the perturbation. The epicyclic motion is taking them in and out of perturbations, and that's the shaking part of the conspiracy. You can do this calculation with disks of varying thicknesses just by varying your initial uh, uh, distribution function, um, and you find as expected that as you look at thicker and thicker disks, the effect decreases uh, that was something that Julian and Tumre were able to estimate um, uh, by sort of a hand wavy calculation that you assume finite thickness of the disk. Um, but here you're actually calculating it directly because you're calculating the vertical poten potential self consistently. And their, their estimate was, was exactly on. So that's comforting. But now we add self-gravity. And so as these particles are cycling in and out of the perturbation, as uh, because the epicyclic frequency is, is well matched with the frequency of the shear, um, we get this enhancement due to self-gravity. And so you can build up the perturbation uh, uh, quite rapidly as you're swinging from um, leading to trailing. And so with self-gravity turned on, those perturbations, which were down uh, below a factor of one in, in units of the initial perturbation, can now see an amplification of a factor of 30. Okay. Self uh, the thickness of the disk reduces that somewhat, but still we're uh, seeing an amplification of the wave quite dramatically as, we, uh, as, as the, this single wave swings across. So here's a, a breathing wave compression. So one can impose an initial 
uh, perturbation to the gravitational field and ask what happens in the absence of self-gravity and it just winds up uh, just as one expects. These, these numbers are just the time in some dimensionless units. But now we add self-gravity and we find that the, the behavior, um, uh, the winding is more epi episodic. Um, so things sort of wind up and then you kind of regenerate uh, new waves and then they wind up again and so forth. And I think the, the movie is maybe more, um, perhaps more illustrative. So here's the kinematic uh, case here, and this is the case with self-gravity. And so um, clearly the evolution, when you turn on self-gravity as this wave is swinging by what's going on in the Z V Z phase space is, is much more complicated. So, so your um, external perturbation here is, Spiral in the it, it is it, right. So if you if you map back to the disk, it would just be a, a a single sort of wave characterized by its wave number in azimuth. So azimuthal wave number um, that starts out as a leading wave and right. then what? I think we'd have be having a leading wave. I, I think I think the idea and you know all the way back to the original papers was that you have all sorts of waves. And the ones that start out as trailing do nothing; they just wrap up. Right. And and the ones that start out as leading, but you know, too far leading, probably don't make it. But the ones that are in the there's a sort of sweet spot of a leading wave, and so the amplifier picks out just those waves that get amplified into the spirals. And is this thought really produced at spiral structure? Is this what really thought to produce spiral structure? Uh, I think it's certainly part of the story. Because I mean, yeah, you see, I, I, I've always been confused. You see these trailing spirals always. Yeah, right. So okay, the idea is you have some potential fluctuations that are important. Yeah, so those leading ones are amplified, so they get yeah. bigger, so they're easier to see as trailing. Right. Right. But you have to be starting off with these right. C small amplitude leading right. Right. So, so that's yeah. So I think that's the. Why is it small yeah. C? Leading perturbations are the ones that are most conspicuous in the, in the snail. Well, um, I mean, once, once things have grown and basically the right. fully amplified trailing spiral modes are no longer having an effect, is that is that the point? Or oh, I, I, I oh, this is still a long way off from. Yeah. Can we explain the Gaia, Gaia spirals? This is uh, Sorry, showing that there's a connection. But to actually go from this to the actual Gaia spirals that we're seeing and some connection, whether that's at all connected with the spiral structure that we see in the galaxy, different question, much harder for it, yeah. Um, but nevertheless, we can uh, take what we've seen here and, and map this into uh, these angle omega coordinates. And so now the spirals become uh, uh, di diagonal bands. And certainly in the kinematic case, we get exactly what we would expect. And so the, the bands lie up, line up perfectly um, with what we would predict from the age of the spirals. Uh, but things are more complicated um, in the case with self-gravity. And so, you know, sometimes you see diagonal bands with the same angles as what you would see in the kinematic case. And in other cases, uh, you see very different types of structures. So it, it's, it, again, uh, this swing amplification is, is this complicated process and, and that is seeing its, its uh, the amplitudes rising and falling as, as this, again, just a single wave sweeps through. Um, you could do this as well for a bending wave. Uh, so in the case of a bending wave, uh, which you can think of as just the unperturbed disk plus a perturbation that's positive uh, above the disk and negative below the disk. Um, and in that case, so that does nothing for the in-plane uh, surface density. So this has nothing to do with spiral structure, which is a uh, symmetric perturbation to the surface density. Um, but if you put a bend into the disk, then in the absence of self-gravity, things just wind up as you would expect. Um, but you still get this episodic 
uh, winding and you get, you know, spirals that are not nearly as tightly wound as you would predict um, from the kinematic argument. And I think the, the argument here is, so you might ask, you know, why, where's the self-gravity in something that's positive and negative uh, uh, at a single position in the galaxy, but, but self-gravity can operate essentially on each of these halves of the disk separately until phase wrapping takes hold. And then once phase wrapping takes hold, you're back to the phase wrapping story. So until phase wrapping takes hold, you can get this amplification. And so I sort of see again what happens. Um, and so, you know, sometimes they look very similar and other times they, they look very different. You characterize these, I mean, self-gravity is often characterized by too many Q. Right. Characterized like what's the Q? Like so these were all done with a Q of about 1.2 or 1. So, so oh, Q... Yeah, so these so so Q is a parameter that goes into your um, uh, unperturbed distribution function, right. and so you can you can that that's an that's a knob that you can play with exactly yeah. Um, so the previous calculations were done with uh, definite uh, a wave of definite wave number. You can as as uh, Julian and Tumre did way back. Um, consider what happens when you put a single perturber into the disk that's co-rotating with your uh, shearing box, um, and then you get a stationary weight. And so this is uh, you know, my version of the classic picture that you find in these papers. And so this wake um, uh, is, is stationary. Particles are uh, moving through the wake, but the wake itself is stationary. And so this is sense similar to the way we think of spiral structure, that spiral waves are not material waves, but stars are moving through the waves in a, and get sort of bunched up and then move apart. And so that's precisely what's happening here. And the interesting things so to those stars just point to these different uh, positions within the disk is that you can find phase spirals. And so these are actually stationary uh, phase spirals um, you know, whether this is realistic, again, whether this has something to do with the Gaia spirals, not at all sure. Um, but it's interesting that these are now stationary features of the disk. And so there is no clock in these phase spirals. Yeah. These spirals are always two arms instead of one arm? Like uh, these are always two arms. And I think that comes from the symmetry of the fact that you put a cloud exactly in the midplane. So it's a symmetric perturbation. Um, with this calculation, of course, then you could start to ask what happens if you allow a cloud to pass through the, the disk. So there are many more, you know, things that you can do once you've developed uh, the analysis tool. Um, it turns out to be computationally simpler to do the stationary case. Uh, the computational complexity is, is uh, not as severe, but you can certainly put in time-dependent uh, perturbations. You could put in um, random perturbation. So you could test uh, the frankel tremaine Bovi idea of putting in random perturbations throughout the disk and, and see what happens with and without self-gravity. Okay, so the conclusions uh, from the shearing box calculations are that self-gravity may be important for amplifying perturbations before vertical phase mixing takes hold. So once the phase, once things get really phase mixed, then uh, then cell gravity will be less important, certainly the case in the, in the case of the bending perturbation. Um, since amplification of the waves as they swing from leading to trailing has a complicated time dependence, uh, so too will the amplitude of the phase spirals and, um, and the simple kinematic recipe for dating the spirals may lead to erroneous results. And so we should uh, sort of rethink how we've been looking at these uh, phase spirals. Um, and, and just as a limiting case, one can actually find stationary phase spirals for the case where the perturber is, a, is on a circular orbit. And I think I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, are there any questions? Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so my question is, school kind of perturbations, 
can be induced from the horizontal perturbations for like for two reasons. One is because obviously because the phase spirals have this vertical profile, right? But the other is because of the the, the spirals can mix orbits with different angular momentum, and because the vertical frequency depends on angular momentum, that would also create a perturbation in the vertical structure. But I guess in your model, you didn't in your shearing box. Yeah. Uh, you your essentially your vertical frequency doesn't depend on x is it that's right so i think one so i think i think this is a good point the the one thing that is difficult to account for in the shearing box is any variation with galactocentric radius and um and you know or guiding radius or and so you know, it's it's both the, the good thing and the bad thing about the model. The good thing is that, that things are more separable and you can do these calculations, um, but you give up, uh, you know, all of the sort of other features of galactic disks that you would expect to come into account. I, I think that's exactly. So I have one more question is about how did you model the vertical potential of the spirals? So what was your density all in the in-plane or was it yeah. well, like a, Vertical profile. Yeah, so there's so the the potential is calculated. So you uh, you're calculating the distribution function. Um, so in a, in a plane wave case, um, there's no x and y dependence. You're calculating the distribution function as a function of z, w, and um, u and v. You know, so you're essentially calculating the full six dimensional phase space. I mean, the, the original external perturbation. The original external ah, good question. So, um, so these were sort of very simple uh, perturbations. In the case of the cloud, it was just an extension of what Tumre and 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 Julian did, which was to uh, essentially you 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 treat you, you have a model for the structure of the cloud vertically and um, in the plane, and then you Fourier transform that, and you you get perturbations that can be divided up into your different different waves as as chris was saying you know some are leading some are trailing and so all of those waves are there in that calculation and then um and and it's the swing amplifier that picks out those particular waves um that get amplified so in, in a sense that that classic picture answers your question which is that wake that you see are those leading waves that were swing amplified into the trailing ones. And so that's what makes that classic uh, wake. It's a naive question, but the that you you a lot of these spirals that you've been showing are selections based on certain parts of the HR diagram. Like do the spirals show up in different ways if you select on different stars? Like assuming just the main sequence, if you look at not giants, for example, dwarves. Um, so I think trying to remember what people have found, um, uh, I think if you, the, the differences in the spirals are most dramatic when you start cutting on kinematic quantities rather than, um, uh, stellar properties. And so if you make cuts on um angular momentum or radial action uh then you can sharpen the spirals so um <clears throat> yeah so if you take a, a hot component versus cold components for example uh i don't i don't know if there've been i i don't maybe yeah 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 so yeah, so I don't know offhand. Someone else may know whether people have tried to slice the spirals in age. We don't, you know, we're only just getting good ages from from Gaia as well. So. Metallicity. In metallicity. Sort of age. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> yeah. What are you saying? You, what are the things you talk about the active spiral about the active spirit, right? You talk about fluctuations. You talked about different uh, 
RG, different vertical actions, they're all gonna smear the spirals. So why is it so sharp? Is it so sharp? Um, I, I guess that's part of the puzzle. And um, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think the best I can say is that, that, that it's still part of the puzzle. When we try even in simple uh, simulation, it's very hard to make these in a full self simulation, even apart from, you know, whether that diffusion in your n body code um, or, or whether we're thinking about the perturbations incorrectly. Thing of the disk, and then you build up just certain spirals. Which, you know, uh, that, I mean, that was, I think that was a nice result of this uh, main at all idea, which was to add a whole bunch of weak perturbations together. Perturbations, and the key there, wash things out on a short enough time scale that combination of the diffusion and the uh, Weak perturbations. Are there more questions? No. Uh, let me check in the online audience. No. So with that, I think we can thank Larry for a beautiful talk.